Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is April 28, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 33. On a summer day in 1971, two men in spacesuits sat aboard an awkward-looking four-wheeled vehicle that was making its way across the surface of the moon. American astronauts David Scott and James Irwin, the lunar landing crew of Apollo 15, were on their way to get a close look at the gigantic lunar canyon known as Hadley Real. They were the first men in history to go for a ride on the lunar surface. As they bumped along, they passed the rim of a crater which they named Earthlight Crater. Mission Control in Houston radioed back, quote, Arthur Clarke would be proud of you, unquote. Sixteen years earlier, in 1955, the renowned British writer Arthur C. Clarke had published a prophetic book with the title Earthlight. Published two years before the space age dawned with Sputnik 1, Earthlight was about man's then future occupation of the moon, and in honor of Clarke's vision, the Apollo 15 astronauts named Earthlight Crater after the book and very often during television coverage of the American visits to the moon, Walter Cronkite of CBS News had at his elbow none other than Arthur C. Clarke. In his book, Clarke painted a vivid picture of the great value the moon would acquire, scientifically, economically, and strategically. The climax of this book, honored so uniquely by the Apollo 15 astronauts, is called the Battle of Pico, a hypothetical space battle centered on the moon. And while the details are quite different, Clark's fictional Battle of Pico foreshadowed in eerie ways the real space battle that took place more than two decades later in September 1977. The Battle of the Harvest Moon has been kept a secret from the public, both by the victor, the Soviet Union, and by the vanquished, the United States of America. But it is the key to understanding the increasingly headlong retreat of the United States on all fronts under the new boldness of the Kremlin. Like September 1977, April 1978 has been a watershed month in the needless decline and fall of the United States and of the Western world. Now as last September, Crucial developments have taken place under the shroud of secrecy with no official hint of what is actually taking place. Now as then, the only public clues to the momentous developments going on behind the scenes are obscure diplomatic maneuvers and mysterious occurrences of all kinds. Last September, for example, there was the mystery of the so-called UFO over Petrozovotsk in the Soviet Union. Then a scant week later there was the loudly trumpeted breakthrough in SALT II negotiations. This breakthrough, we were told, accounted for the highly unusual sudden nighttime meeting with Jimmy Carter at the White House demanded by Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko. As I told you that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, the object over Petrozovotsk was not a UFO, and the major media stories about assault breakthrough were lies to mislead the public, and today, seven months later, there still is no SALT II agreement. This month there is the alleged mystery of the Korean airliner that intruded into Soviet airspace while Secretary of State Vance was in Moscow to discuss arms limitations. The talks took place against a background of clear Soviet threats that this was to be America's last chance to conclude a SALT II treaty. The talks ended as deadlocked as ever, but suddenly the Soviet stance in public is the embodiment of sweet reason and patience. Meanwhile, Secretary Vance refuses to tell the public anything about what went on in Moscow. Today the Republic of the United States of America is in the twilight of final decline, 
prior to nuclear war. Our secret rulers behind the scenes are still trying to salvage what they can from their ruined plan for world conquest, and in the process are making our situation even more desperate day by day. They are manipulating our economy and our politics to their own ends. They still believe that their wealth will save them from the nuclear nightmare that they are bringing upon the rest of us, and they are stalling for time, hoping to obtain the fruits of crash projects and military development in time to stave off the crushing military might of the Soviet Union. Since the Battle of the Harvest Moon seven months ago, ideology is rapidly being cast aside as a determining factor for the actions of governments. As the world drifts closer to war, it's increasingly every nation for itself in the arena of world affairs. Historical patterns and alignments are pushing aside ideological arguments, and the survival instinct is taking the place of treaties and even of long-standing friendships between nations. The shabby treatment of America's allies by our secret rulers over the years is now coming home to roost. Even now, as we are being backed into a corner, our rulers are continuing to throw chunks of meat to the advancing Russian bear to buy a few moments of time. As our rulers throw away a weapon here, an ally there, the Russian bear pauses for a moment to digest each gain, and then presses ever closer. And as we are backed into the position of Fortress America, we are increasingly a fortress without weapons and without the spirit to survive. Like France before May 10, 1940, we hear daily assurances of our military strength and the dependability of our untried defenses. But like France in 1940, we are eaten up within by spies, inaction, and apathy. My friends, there are those who say I should not tell you the whole truth about behind-the-scenes events that are determining your fate because, they say, I am frightening the people. But consider these words of a famous German psychiatrist, quote, Fear can be disruptive, leading to panic, immobility, and abdication of rationality in favor of blind emotion. It can also be constructive, creative in the search for ways of escape, sharpening the wits in order to avoid or overcome danger. One of the difficulties is that so many of us are too apathetic to be afraid, either trusting to fate to extricate us or shrugging our shoulders at the prospect of what will be will be." Unquote. When nuclear war comes, including geophysical warfare, only those who have been forewarned will have any chance of avoiding the panic that will seize those who are taken by surprise. Only total exposure can prevent nationwide panic. The American people will bow to a dictatorial government as our Republic collapses in flames, and only total exposure plus a spiritual reawakening could possibly turn aside the man-made catastrophe that is in store for all of us. My three special topics for today are Topic No. 1, Inflation gold, and the stock market bear trap. Topic No. 2, Korean Airlines Flight 902, the Flying Lusitania. And Topic No. 3, the Twilight of the United States Republic. Topic No. 1. For several years now the stock market has been following a long-term trend downward, crashing in slow motion. But just two weeks ago, on April 14, 1978, the stock market in New York suddenly jumped out of the doldrums as if on signal. Without plausible explanation, trading volumes soared to astronomical levels, setting all-time records while the Dow Jones averages raced upward steadily. Meanwhile, government economic statistics were sold to the public as showing that our economy was picking up 
and even the badly slumping United States dollar appeared to be gaining a new lease on life thanks to rumors that the United States Government was about to start auctioning off gold to prop up the dollar. But as every housewife knows, inflation is advancing steadily, eating up the family budget and making it even harder to make ends meet. And while the Government drones on and on about inflation of a few percent per year, shoppers find prices on practically everything today leaping upward week by week. It's enough to make one think the Government and the stock market are in a dream world of their own. And my friends, they are. We still hear monthly about America's balance of payments deficit, even though it has become an obsolete measurement. As I explained five years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, the traditional balance of payments measurement has been outmoded by multinational corporations, most of them owned and controlled by our secret rulers. Over 200 of the mightiest of these, together with their multinational banks, form the economic empire of the Rockefeller Cartel. Multinationals push money and goods around among themselves however they please, and as these dollars cross national borders, they cause a nation's balance of payments to reflect whatever they choose. For example, foreign affiliates of American multinational corporations send oil from abroad to America and are paid in dollars that contribute to a so-called negative balance of payments for the United States, even though the companies involved are effectively Rockefeller-controlled on all sides of the transactions. Today the greatest single export by American multinational companies is jobs. The economic manipulations that have helped to solidify Rockefeller control over the United States have also forced costs in the United States to soar compared to other countries. So increasingly the multinationals buy labor in cheaper markets overseas that used to account for jobs in America. The result is a steadily rising hard core of unemployed who can no longer find jobs. This process has turned the United States increasingly into a service-oriented economy while our basic industries have declined. There was a time not so long ago when the words Made in USA were stamped on many of the products that dominated world markets, but no more. Today in many cases only the name is American. The product itself is European or Japanese or Mexican or otherwise foreign made. Now this process has gone so far that even the American lead in aerospace is fast disappearing. As major new generations of commercial aircraft are being considered for the world's airline fleets, lately the competition is being won by European manufacturers, not American. Until recently aircraft exports have long been the single major bright spot in America's increasingly dismal export picture. Now that too is slipping from our grasp. As we Americans look around us today, we are unconsciously seeing a hollow shell of what used to be. Like a perfectly painted timber of wood eaten up inside by termites, it still looks impressive, but the real strength is gone. Much of the technological and economic power that used to be America's now resides abroad, in Europe, in Japan, and in the Soviet Union. The process of milking the United States economically and technologically strengthened in 1961. It was part of the two-pronged Grand Plan for World Conquest that was set in motion in 1961 by our secret rulers, the four Rockefeller Brothers and their associates. As I've explained in detail in earlier tapes, one prong of this plan was visible in its effects, involving the gradual weakening of the United States to the point of military vulnerability. This was to culminate in a carefully programmed nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the United States, primarily on American soil. But then, after the American people had been beaten down to such an extent that we would accept complete dictatorship under Rockefeller control, the second prong of the plan was to be put into effect, that is, a double cross of the Soviet Union by their secret allies, the Rockefellers. 
using super-secret weapons developed since 1961. The plan was to utterly destroy the Soviet Union as the climax of the war, and the Rockefellers would have emerged as the undisputed masters of the entire world. This grand plan came to ruin seven months ago in the disastrous space battle of the Harvest Moon, but the bitter fruits of this diabolical plan are still with us. In order to be in a position to profit from nuclear war on the soil of the United States, the Rockefellers transferred the bulk of their assets ahead of time to areas where they would not be touched by NUCLEAR WAR ONE. This included multinational affiliates in Europe and Latin America, as well as to the tightly controlled Rockefeller corporate empire in Japan. It also included massive transfers of American money, technology, and military secrets to the Soviet Union to cement the Rockefeller-Soviet alliance until the day of Double Cross. The plan also included the spiriting away of the huge monetary gold hoard of the United States. In the magic year of 1961, when the entire grand plan was getting underway, the monetary aspect of the plan got underway in the form of the London Gold Pool Agreement. Under the cloak of this authority, America's gold flowed out of the United States in a continuing hemorrhage from 1961 to 1968 when the Gold Pool was ended. The ending of the London Gold Pool Agreement on March 17, 1968 was followed the very next day by the signing of Public Law 90-269 by President Lyndon Johnson. With the stroke of a pen, the requirement that the United States dollar be backed by gold was eliminated, and on August 15, 1971, President Richard Nixon closed the gold window, declaring by executive order that the United States would no longer redeem dollars with gold even in international monetary transactions. It was a declaration of war on the dollar, and since then American inflation and sinking dollar values have gone hand in hand. According to official United States Treasury figures, the United States still retains the world's largest monetary gold hoard, some 277 million ounces. But four years ago this month, in April 1974, I testified before Congress to the fact that the Treasury figures are falsified and that the United States is in fact gold poor. Based on very solid intelligence information, I described the secret removal of vast quantities of gold from the bullion depository at Fort Knox for transferal to powerful private interests. I stood ready to present my evidence and witnesses under oath before a Federal Grand Jury or Congressional investigation with subpoena power, but there was no investigation. So I made my charges public by every available means, offering to go to jail as a rabble-rouser if I could not prove my charges in a proper legal form. But still no honest investigation of any kind materialized. Instead worried by mounting public pressure, the Treasury arranged a Public Relations peep show at Fort Knox. There invited Congressmen and newsmen were shown stacks of strangely reddish bars of alleged gold in just one small compartment. This was followed by a so-called gold audit which, when it was finally released after months of delay, said only, quote, unquote, we believe that the gold is there. The United States Treasury Department has been aware for some time that something would have to be done about the resurgence of concern about Fort Knox. So during 1977, about 1.5 million ounces of gold were obtained from Portugal. This plus other assorted reserves of mostly junk gold that have been scraped together brings America's true gold stock right now to just over 3.5 million ounces. This is a mere pittance compared with the 277 million ounces on official Treasury books but it does provide something to use for psychological gold sales once again. Earlier this month the Treasury made a big deal of announcing that the United States will hold six monthly auctions of gold, amounting to 300,000 ounces each. At this rate, if the United States really had the claimed stocks of gold, 
Auctions could be held monthly for 77 years, yet the Treasury offers to do so only for six months as a psychological ploy. Several years ago the Rockefellers and their associates began the process of bailing out in preparation for war. Now, using their control of certain key financial institutions here and abroad, they have suddenly created an artificial stock market run-up known in some circles as a bear trap. The idea is to have these controlled holders of large blocks of stock begin trading among themselves in a frenzy back and forth, raising prices and generating tremendous stock market trading volume in the process. Soon unsuspecting outside investors, the so-called bears who have been leery of the sick stock market are drawn into the fray to invest in what looks like a bull market. The situation may continue for some time, but when the smoke clears, the big controlled investors who created the artificial bull market will have cut their bloated portfolios, and the normally bearish outside investors who have bought their stocks at inflated prices will be left holding the bag. Without the artificial pressures now being applied, the stock market will once again begin sinking, and the bears who have been sucked into the stock market whirlpool will be trapped. The stock market bear trap now in progress is bad enough, but there is a far worse bear trap that is now closing around our secret rulers as well as the rest of us, and that is the war trap of the Russian bear. Topic No. 2 On May 7, 1915, the passenger liner Lusitania was nearing the end of its journey from the United States to Great Britain. The Great War was underway, and for nearly three months a German submarine blockade of Britain had been in effect. But the nearly 2,000 passengers aboard the ship were not expecting trouble because, after all, the Lusitania was a passenger vessel. Suddenly, without warning, torpedoes struck the Lusitania. She was under attack from a German submarine. Soon the Lusitania sank and nearly 1,200 lives were lost. Only later did it come out that the Lusitania had been carrying large quantities of vital war materiel below decks, war materiel that was subject to the announced blockade by Germany. The attempt had been made to sneak this war cargo through the blockade by using nearly 2,000 unsuspecting passengers as a protective shield against attack but the attempt had failed with tragic consequences. This month on April 20, 1978, a modern-day parallel to the Lusitania incident took place when a Korean Airlines Boeing 707 penetrated Soviet airspace and finally was shot down. As with the Lusitania, Korean Airlines Flight 902 was carrying out a military mission using the lives of unsuspecting passengers as a protective shield against attack. But this time the mission was not the delivery of war materiel, but the gathering of intelligence. Korean Airlines Flight 902 was 39 minutes late taking off from Paris that day due to an unexplained delay. Then the 707 took off into the afternoon sun, heading northwest over the Norwegian Sea on its Arctic route to Anchorage, Alaska. Periodically the pilot checked in with ground stations, and as long as the 707 was within tracking range of radar, it was right on course. After passing over northern Greenland, Flight 902 passed out of the range of ground radar installations. Later the pilot reported that he was approaching Ellesmere Island in extreme northern Canada, but in fact he had put his plane into a slow, sweeping U-turn to the right, flying a course towards an unannounced destination, the Soviet Union. And the final position report to Northern Canada, given while the jet was still outside radar tracking range, served to prevent anyone from guessing what was afoot. The Korean 707 raced into Soviet airspace from the north and passed directly over the Mammoth Submarine Base at Murmansk, the headquarters of the Soviet Northern Fleet. There is no naval site in the entire Soviet Union that is more secret or sensitive than Murmansk. As two Sukhoi-15 jet fighters were scrambled to intercept the 707, it continued southeastward across the Kola Peninsula, which is dotted with military installations, 
and like Murmansk, highly sensitive. The 707 forged ahead on its pre-planned flight route without regard for the fighters. It did not slow down, turn on landing lights, or do anything else to respond to the Soviet fighters, one of which flew alongside, the other trailing behind the 707. After passing almost completely across the Kola Peninsula, Flight 902 was about to head across the narrow White Sea to pass over the port of Archangel, and not far beyond it the super-secret Plesetsk Cosmodrome. At that point Moscow ordered the fighters to force the 707 down by damaging it, but not to destroy it. The fighter that had been alongside dropped back and away, and the other opened fire, taking care not to destroy control surfaces or ignite the fuel tanks. Gunfire from the fighter tore holes in the fuselage, killing one passenger outright, fatally wounding another, and injuring perhaps a dozen more. Cabin pressure began dropping fast, and now the 707 was forced to dive to lower altitudes very rapidly. Within five minutes the 707 had dropped to only 3,000 feet, where it flew around for another hour and a half before landing finally in a wide, clear area far from any airport. Throughout the time that the Korean 707 was flying through Russian skies, special instruments installed on the plane were generating reconnaissance data. The data, together with the cockpit conversation, were transmitted in coded form to CIA receivers just beyond the Soviet border. This is why National Security Advisor Brzezinski was able so quickly to announce that Soviet fighters had fired on the Korean 707. As an intelligence mission, Korean Airlines Flight 902 was a success, but when you hear why it was necessary, you will begin to understand just how desperate America's military situation has become. I now continue with Topic No. 2. As I say these words, several days have passed since the Soviet Union allowed a Pan American jetliner to fly the crew, passengers, and bodies of the two passengers who were killed from Murmansk to Helsinki, Finland. Everyone was released except the pilot and navigator who are still detained in Russia for questioning. We have heard all kinds of stories in the major news media trying to convince us that the flight crew became disoriented, quote unquote, that the navigation instruments of the 707 somehow misbehaved and misled the crew, and that the United States Government is very puzzled about it all. But after the crew and passengers were rescued from the crash-landed Korean 707, it very quickly became obvious to Soviet authorities that the intrusion into Russian airspace could not have been accidental. For example, the navigation instruments on a Boeing 707 use what is called redundant design so that the failure of even a major component in the system cannot destroy the accuracy of the navigational data available to the crew. As for the effects of magnetic compass variations in Arctic regions, these effects are real, but for many years jet transports have been using polar routes many times daily without difficulty because there are standard techniques to correct for these magnetic variations. The crew of Korean Airlines Flight 902 were well experienced in polar flights and in using these techniques, and yet for the whole episode to have been accidental, the seasoned pilot, co-pilot, and navigator would have had to miss the most familiar and unmistakable of all navigation clues, the position of the sun. Even some of the passengers said after their ordeal, that they had privately become worried when midway through the flight the sun shifted around from a position ahead of them to a point behind the plane. As if that were not enough, Flight 902 just happened to enter Soviet airspace with pinpoint accuracy to pass directly over the critical Murmansk area. Then faced with the menace of a jet interceptor alongside the 707, with its red Soviet star clearly visible even to many passengers, Flight 902 just forged ahead deeper and deeper into highly sensitive Russian military territory. No, my friends, 
There was nothing accidental about the Korean airliner's flight into the frozen north of Russia. Those who suspect that it was an intelligence mission are correct, but that raises two questions that go to the heart of the matter. What intelligence information could possibly be so urgent that the lives of 110 people were put at risk in order to obtain it? And why was it necessary to resort to such a crude means of intelligence gathering? My friends, you will search the major media news reports in vain looking for the answers to these two questions. And your sworn public servants, so-called, in the Federal Government are busy trying to play dumb about it so they won't tell you. But if you will simply review the progress of events that I have been telling you about over the past seven months, you will be able to understand what happened without any difficulty. The events leading up to the Korean Airliner incident began seven months earlier to the day on September 20, 1977. At about 4 a.m. local time on that date, a newly operational Soviet killer satellite destroyed an American spy satellite over the northern Russian town of Petrozavodsk. The killer satellite involved was Cosmos 929, the first in a fleet of manned Cosmos interceptors, which destroyed targets by means of charged particle beam weapons. The American spy satellite erupted into an immense fireball as it exploded in space. The display was so spectacular that it was seen as far away as Helsinki, Finland, and described as a jellyfish-like UFO in news reports here. Last September in AUDIO LETTER No. 26 I described this first destruction of an American spy satellite in more detail, and on October 4, 1977, just a few days after I revealed the existence of operational Soviet killer satellites in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, Defense Secretary Harold Brown held a press conference at the Pentagon. He stunned everyone by confirming the newly operational Soviet capability in killer satellites, but he refused to say anything about how they work. So many reporters have speculated incorrectly that they are of an old, explosive, unmanned design. During October, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 27, the Soviet Union launched six more Cosmos interceptors into orbit. All around the world they began blasting American spy satellites, and during October 1977 strange reports of fireballs in the sky peppered the news. Meanwhile, virtually the entire Soviet submarine fleet was deployed in attack positions around the United States to discourage any American effort to retaliate for the destruction of our spy satellites. By early November the situation with our spy satellites was becoming critical, and Soviet military pressure on the controlled Carter Administration was building fast. On November 18, 1977, the Voice of America was used to hurl a war threat at Russia over the spy satellite crisis which I quoted in part in AUDIO LETTER No. 28. A preemptive American attack on the Soviet Union was being seriously considered by the Carter Administration, but once again the overwhelming power of the Soviet Navy was used to stop that idea in its tracks. On January 24, 1978, Cosmos 954, the mysterious Soviet nuclear satellite, crash-landed in Canada. As I explained that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 30, Cosmos 954 was the very killer satellite that had been used four months earlier in the Battle of the Harvest Moon. But few people paid much attention a week later when Cosmos 929, the very first operational Soviet killer satellite, returned to Earth on February 2, 1978. Meanwhile, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 31, more than 30 Soviet Cosmos interceptors equipped with particle beam weapons were in orbit patrolling the Earth by then. Last month, as I called to your attention in AUDIO LETTER No. 32, the Kremlin repeated its SALT II surrender ultimatum to the United States. It was March 27, six months to the day after America lost the Battle of the Harvest Moon 
and Gromyko delivered the first SALT II ultimatum at the White House. The official Soviet newspaper Pravda delivered the ultimatum using the language of diplomacy, and the Jumpy Carter Administration once again verged on panic. Only two days later it was announced that Secretary of State Vance would meet with Soviet Foreign Minister Gorobiko to talk about SALT II, perhaps in Geneva. But in the end Vance was forced to make his pilgrimage hat in hand to the Fountainhead, Moscow. By the time of the initial announcement of a planned Vance Gromyko meeting, Leonid Brezhnev No. 2 was off to the Soviet Far East in company with Defense Minister Marshal Dmitry Ustinov. Brezhnev No. 2 is the ceremonial double who has been taking the place of the real Brezhnev in public functions. Beginning a few weeks after the real Brezhnev's death in Moscow on January 7, 1978, it is now Ustinov who is the strongest man in the Kremlin. Ustinov is the new Khrushchev, allowing others to present the image of power while he is consolidating his own leadership behind the scenes. My friends, the use of doubles in politics and diplomacy is scarcely ever suspected by the public. After all, we are the ones who are supposed to be fooled by it. But at the diplomatic level, it is not an uncommon practice at all, and when a double is detected, a diplomatic tradition is not to comment about it in any way. To do so would be seen as interference in the internal affairs of another country, something for which the Soviet Union has no tolerance. So even though Secretary of State Cyrus Vance and others know Brezhnev No. 2 is a double, they simply go along with the charade. Can you imagine? During the Far Eastern trip by Brezhnev II and Ustinov, disputed border regions between the Soviet Union and China were visited. Rousing speeches to Soviet troops were used to extract shouted pledges from the troops to protect the motherland, but China was only partially the target of all this. On April 7, Brezhnev II made a speech aboard a cruiser in the port of Vladivostok dwelling not on China but on the United States. The Carter Administration was accused of vacillation and inconsistency in the SALT II negotiations, and the point was made that by stalling the United States was on the verge of losing the chance altogether for a SALT II agreement. When American intelligence analysts heard that, they shuddered. SALT II is secretly intended to be America's surrender treaty through unilateral disarmament. The only alternative to surrender under an ultimatum is war itself, and Brezhnev II's words had not been chosen lightly. After the Vladivostok speech, he turned momentarily toward Ustinov for a nod of approval, and he got it. It was increasingly clear that the Vance trip to Moscow was taking on an either-or significance. Either Vance would find a way to continue stalling without raising excessive Soviet anger, or he would have to sign on the dotted line. If possible, delay is wanted by those who are controlling the United States Government, because Operation Desktop has been reactivated. In January 1977 I revealed that the CIA had planted a fleet of undersea supermissiles on the floor of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans but that they had begun leaking and becoming disabled one by one. In one instance after I revealed this, the leakage poisoned whales in the ocean east of Florida, and they began beaching themselves to die in great numbers near Jacksonville, Florida. Today the entire original fleet of CIA undersea missiles are defunct, but Operation Desktop which originally planted these missiles in the sea has been reactivated, and a new fleet of undersea missiles is being planted. This is being done under cover of drilling off the East Coast for oil. Many of the drilling operations going on there now are genuine, but Exxon, the oldest and most tightly controlled of all Rockefeller corporations, is being used in Operation Desktop. In August 1976, when the Soviet underwater missile crisis was secretly in progress, 
Exxon set the whole oil industry abuzz by bidding fantastic amounts in order to control large sections of the Atlantic oil field now being explored. Now Exxon is using the Glomar Pacific drilling ship in connection with Operation Desktop. The Glomar Pacific is a sister ship to the famous Glomar Explorer, the Howard Hughes Mystery Ship so-called, which was used in the original Operation Desktop. So the American strategy is to keep buying time. It hopes that the new fleet of CIA undersea missiles and other ad hoc actions can be completed in time to counter the crushing military power of Russia. But remembering the nightmare days of last fall, following the Battle of the Harvest Moon, the Soviet words of late suggested that any further delay by Vance in Moscow could be the last straw. It was concluded that for Vance to know how to play it, he would have to be provided with up-to-the-minute intelligence on the Soviet military alert status while the talks were underway. If it were found that the Soviet forces were in a posture of readiness to launch an attack, Vance would have no choice but to agree in principle to the secret surrender provisions of SALT II. But if Soviet forces were in a lower alert posture, he was to continue stalling with just enough concessions to avoid a total deadlock. A year ago there would have been no problem in providing Vance with this crucial go versus no-go intelligence information, because a year ago the United States still had a network of spy satellites in orbit. Now we don't. I can now reveal that the orbital fleet of the Soviet Cosmos interceptors has finished the job of eliminating America's spy satellites that can make observations in the Soviet Union. We have not retaliated because we dare not. We no longer have the ability to detect Soviet ICBMs at the moment of launch, so any ICBM missile attack will produce only the much shorter warning provided by our early warning radar network and we can no longer watch troop movements and other military activities continuously throughout the Soviet Union. So it was clear that a special reconnaissance flight would have to be flown in order to provide the intelligence Vance needed in Moscow, but the advanced air defenses of the Soviet Union could now shoot down any Western reconnaissance aircraft, including even the RS-71 which flies 20 miles high at three times the speed of sound. The only chance was to use an airplane the Russians might refrain from shooting at, that is, a passenger airplane, and to minimize suspicion it could not be an American plane. As I pointed out two months ago, the disastrous aftermath of the Battle of the Harvest Moon had brought about a major rethinking of the announced Carter plan to pull troops out of South Korea. Someone suggested that this slowdown, which was already being planned, be offered to South Korea in exchange for a South Korean intelligence flight into Soviet territory. This plan was adopted and the fate of Korean Airlines Flight 902 was sealed. On April 20, 1978, Secretary of State Vance was in Moscow. It was the first day of his talks with Gromyko. Seemingly by coincidence, that same day Korean Airlines Flight 902 strayed into Soviet airspace and flew around over a tremendous concentration of Russian military installations. By the time the 707 finally landed, American intelligence officials had their answer. The Soviet Union was not preparing for an immediate attack. The news was flashed to Vance in Moscow, and the stalling proceeded according to plan. The very next day Jimmy Carter announced a delay in the troop pullout plan for South Korea. The Korean Airline incident illustrates one very important fact that is often forgotten. Regardless of the weapons involved, Strategy is always of paramount importance and can sometimes tip the balance against tremendous odds. 
and of all strategic factors, surprise is the most powerful. The Korean 707 succeeded in penetrating the most powerful air defense system in the world because the Russians were caught off guard. They were not expecting such a stunt. Just imagine, my friends, what the impact will be when the military might of Russia is combined with surprise in the war to come. Topic No. 3 What I am trying to do in my tapes, my friends, is to help enable you to interpret the present in the light of the future. Once you understand where events are heading and why, you will no longer be mystified and caught by surprise by the turbulent events of today. But no one can grasp anything about what the future holds unless he has learned the lessons of the past. Looking at the Republic of the United States today, some of the most vivid lessons we should have learned from the past came out of the collapse of the French Third Republic in 1940. The collapse of France in the face of Hitler's military machine in 1940 was shocking, but it was inevitable. The seeds of defeat had already been sown in France during the preceding years when France refused to recognize the reality of the threat and take action to protect herself. Like America today, France was eaten up from within by spies. Yet like America today, France felt safe behind its Maginot Line, and for public consumption there were continuous assurances that French military forces were adequate to maintain French security. The ability of France to defend herself turned out to be pure fiction. When the moment of truth arrived, the fine images and self-deception collapsed, and with them the French Third Republic. Today the United States is nearing the moment of truth, following a period of decay, self-deception, and image-making that parallels that of France from 1933 to 1940. Alexander Wirth, W-E-R-T-H, has written a book about that period titled The Twilight of France, published in New York by Fertig in 1966. In the introduction, D. W. Brogan wrote the following words, and I quote, That France was beaten in 1940 was not surprising. Only a miracle could have prevented that. But not only had the world come to expect miracles of France, the world was dazzled by the victory of 1918." Unquote. And I quote again, The French defeat was not surprising. What was surprising was the failure to preserve the fruits of victory, those minimum guarantees of French security. Unquote. Like France in 1940, the United States today is basking in the afterglow of victory long since dead. And like France in 1940, we have failed to preserve minimum guarantees for our own security. In fact, America has slipped even farther than France because under the guise of arms limitation we have shut down air defense systems, military bases and Navy installations, and otherwise abandoned the defense of our own homeland. Historians are unable to find any precedent in history for such suicidal action by a great power. The twilight of the United States has now guaranteed that it is humanly impossible for the United States either to turn aside or to win a war with the Soviet Union. Only a miracle could do that, but we as a nation do not deserve a miracle. Instead of the faith in God that built the United States, most Americans now put their faith in the United States itself as if it were a godlike being that could never go wrong and never be defeated. In the midst of the Moscow meetings this month between Vance and Gromyko, a Soviet spokesman reiterated for the last time in clear terms that this was America's last chance to sign a SALT II treaty. And despite the seeming improvement in the tone of the talks, 
and regardless of the seeming Soviet willingness to keep talking about SALT II, this was America's last chance to surrender by that route. The Russians know that the controlled Carter Administration is stalling for time. They know about Operation Desktop and the other ad hoc efforts to find some military threat of significance to aim at the Soviet Union. And they know about the Rockefeller moves to try to turn China into a credible deterrent, but it is all too little and too late. The Kremlin has no intention of allowing these desperate maneuverings to bear fruit, but plans to cut them short with war on Soviet terms and at a time chosen by the Soviet Union. Since the end of the Moscow talks on April 22, 1978, the Kremlin has committed itself to a step-by-step -step clearing of the decks for war. There is no rigid timetable, but there are definite steps planned. The intention is to complete as many as possible before launching war against the United States so that it will be possible to concentrate fully on America's conquest when the time comes. Even so, the Soviet Union stands ready for war at any moment. Very important to the Kremlin is a propaganda campaign which has already started to get the Russian people ready for war. The Soviet Union is going out of its way to seem reasonable and constructive about arms control in particular, while the United States is being painted as uncooperative and threatening. Another top priority has to do with Soviet invasion preparations in Canada and Mexico, which I described last month. After the initial surprise nuclear attack, the Soviet Union wants to be ready to mobilize its troops, tanks, artillery, and weapon caches quickly for invasion across our northern and southern borders. There is also the major matter of Red China, over which a tug-of-war has erupted between the Soviet Union and the United States. This is so important that two days ago Brezhnev No. 2 sent a Deputy Foreign Minister to Peking for talks about the border dispute. In the days ahead, China will be increasingly the focus of attention by both sides, but the sleeping giant should have been left alone because the pressures and inducements now being showered on China by the Rockefeller interests are tending to make China more revisionist and therefore more similar to Russia in political thinking. So unwittingly, our secret masters are helping to bring Russia and China closer together, not farther apart. As war approaches, the United States will be plagued increasingly by sabotage and by acts of geophysical warfare such as floods, storms, and artificial earthquakes, especially in California. But the biggest surprise in store for America in the coming war are the cosmospheres now hovering over our heads. Unlike the United States in recent years, the Soviet Union has never forgotten that quantity can be just as important as quality in a weapons system, and in preparation for the coming conflict, the number of Cosmospheres deployed worldwide and especially over the United States began mushrooming early this month. Based on my intelligence information, as of April 26, two days ago, there are 216, repeat, 216 Soviet Cosmospheres armed with particle beam weapons now hovering over locations throughout the United States. There are nine over the Washington, D.C. area alone, three each over New York City, Roanoke, Virginia, and Phoenix, Arizona. Also there are Cosmospheres located over military installations, dams, state capital cities, and other major cities. Presently they are most heavily concentrated in the northeast area of the United States but there are 12 each over California and Texas and 9 over Kansas. The Carter Administration knows all too well how close we are to war. That is why we are hearing more and more about a possible national emergency, gas rationing, and so forth. Congress knows too, but they, like the Executive Branch, refuse to tell you the truth. As citizens of the United States, we are now just like the trusting passengers of Korean Airlines Flight 902. We are just going along for the ride, trusting our pilots in Washington. And even when we see dramatic and disturbing signs of something that is terribly wrong, we as a people refuse to accept the responsibility left to us 
by the founders of our Republic. Instead of picking up the constitutional tools that were left to us to prevent disaster, we react like the passengers on the Korean plane who wondered why the sun was suddenly behind them instead of ahead of them. We think it must be all right. Surely they must know what they are doing. But my friends, our Republic is now in the hands of men who don't know what they are doing. They know all about lies, intrigue, and trickery, but they know nothing about honest leadership, nor do they care about it. And so the twilight of the Republic of the United States of America is deepening before our very eyes. We have turned away from the light of freedom that comes only from God, and we are flying into the darkness of war. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.